hello everyone. Uh, we're very delighted to have another of our Georgetown conversations. Today, it's all about international trade. And we can't get a better speaker than my very good friend, uh, Dr. Patrick Lowe, uh, who was the former chief economist uh, of, uh, of the World Trade Organization. Patrick and I go back a long way because we were both at the World Bank together. He was on the trade side and I was on the finance side. Now, Patrick uh, graduated from Kent University uh, and then studied PhD at the University of Sussex uh, and then went on to work with uh, GATT, you know, which is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, then worked in the World Bank. Uh, we overlapped for a while. Uh, and then he rose to become Chief Economist of WTO. We met again when we were at the uh, Fung Global Institute, which was the predecessor to the Asia Global Institute. And Patrick joined as the Vice President for Research. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Patrick. Very good Thank to you. have you. And um, I thought you would like to start, uh, if you can, by describing you know, why you are in trade, why do you think trade is so important in this age today. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Why I'm in trade? Well, I don't know really. I think it just happened. When I was very young, I always wanted to be an economist. And somehow trade seemed to appeal because having been born and brought up in Kenya, Kenya was one of those countries that if it didn't trade, it didn't have very much going for it. And I think that's true of the vast majority of countries around the world. So trade is, is really important. And that importance is emphasized considerably by the current crisis because growth is going to dip probably to a degree not seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And it's going to take some doing to come back from that. So trade really matters in that context. Well, um, here uh, we're in a very strange situation. We have arrived at, uh, uh, after probably three years of trade disputes uh, between US and China. And uh, I, if I recall correctly, what has happened in the last three years is gradually trade growth has declined relative to uh, global growth. It used to be the relationship that trade growth would always be faster than uh, uh, you know, world growth, right? Uh, uh, but you know, because of these uh, you know, trade conflicts, uh, you know, world growth has begun to slow and then trade has slowed faster. Do you see this as a long-term trend? That's a really good question. I, I think the jury is out as to how long term this trend will be. But the reality is that until the turn of the century, trade had grown two and a half or three times faster on average than uh, GDP. When GDP dived, trade went down even more. And so things were starting to slow down at the beginning of just before the, the Great Recession. 2008, 2009, just before that, they, it, it started to go down. And it's been pretty much downhill since then. And I think, as you say, for the last few years, it's been hit particularly hard by protectionist trade policy. Um, United States, fundamentally, the question of United States going after uh, China and many other countries doing things in, at fairly large scale. Little things, one by one by themselves, you'd say, well, that doesn't really matter, but you add them all up. And trade policy is not looking uh, very healthy. And we've seen, particularly in the, in the context of the crisis, how countries have rushed to impose export restrictions on, on vital um, products in, 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 in relation to medic medicines, pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, food. Uh, so we're in a difficult place. Well, the, the issue here is that um, trade was very good when uh, China joined the WTO. 
And then China literally became the world's largest trading partner, overtaking the United States, right? Yeah. It, uh, China, uh, well, there are really two supply chains in the world. You know, one in Western Europe and America, and the other were the Asian global supply chain. Yes. Uh, as we all know, Japan was the center, and then the center of gravity shifted uh, uh, in the, after the Asian crisis towards the uh, four tigers, and then, the, you know, so four dragons, economies and then the four tigers and then it moved to china and then china because of its large scale became the center of the global supply chain now the conflicts between the united states and 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 and, and, and china stems from the fact that the advanced economies uh, particularly america has become to be hollowed out and that's why they have now kind of begun to ask questions whether they want to onshore their manufacturing. Um, that has huge implications on the global supply chain, which you and I studied quite a lot at the Flume Global Institute. Can you give us you know, some perspective of whether, how these supply chains are changing and uh, you know, uh, whether they will be decoupling? Yeah, I think just before that, I'd also say something about China and the US and the role of the, the World Trade Organization in the rise of China. I was actually, uh, when China was in the process of joining the WTO uh, in 1999, 2000, 2001, after 15 years of, of, of trying to get in and uh, you know, up and down negotiations, the feeling was, I, I used to go to China a lot with my boss at the time because I was uh, the chief of staff for a short while in, in the WTO. And you know, one one on one one time we met um, Zhu Rongji, the the premier, who was in charge of the of the negotiation from the Chinese side, and he took my boss aside for a talk, and he gave he gave my boss a, a long lecture on on Chinese politics, explaining the different factions and the different interests and how there was the Shanghai lot and the Beijing lot and how the Beijing lot weren't as happy as the Shanghai lot with the idea of getting into the World Trade Organization. And he, he basically talked as if, and I think he genuinely believed it, and so did many other people. I don't think it was just a matter of Western arrogance. I think there was a sense in China that China was indeed going to converge around a market-oriented model. And that lecture from the premier to my boss was essentially designed to say look we are being asked to do a lot of things that no other country has ever been asked to do on the altar of joining the WTO this is humiliating this is difficult I'm talking to you about this because I want you to go and tell the, uh, the Americans and to tell the Europeans that they need to back off give us a break uh, otherwise, this is going to be much more difficult for us. Where they, we represent the interests fundamentally based in Shanghai. We do want this to happen, and it will make it more difficult. So my boss goes back to Geneva, and he calls up the, the, the senior trade officials of the US and the EU and relays this conversation. They like my boss, and they're very polite to him, but they basically tell him that it's not his business, and nothing very much changes. But I think what happened after that is that for the, perhaps the next five to 10 years, China did look as if it was pursuing a more market-oriented orientation. It was only a matter of time. And then things changed and things moved, moved, moved away from that. But at the same time, China was growing remarkably fast. And when I talked to Chinese people, when we were in Hong Kong, I used to ask people, I said, well, what's your view of the, of the WTO? And they will say two things. One was, well, many of us felt that they were being too harsh on us, but none of us will, will, uh, will deny that without the protections of the WTO in the, in the 2000s, that we would have been able to rise like this. And all that has now come tumbling down. And so that rise of China, to go back to the supply chains, was very much predicated around the idea that China was going to be a core part of the supply chain. In the beginning, mostly simply assembly, final stage production, but increasingly producing valuable inputs not from imports, but from domestic, from domestic output. 
And so that idea, that, that, that notion of China being a center was really absolutely valid and it was, a, it was deepened over those years. Um, and and so, so a lot of the trade that China had with uh, the West, and not just the West, of course, with, with Asia too, um, was, was a, com a combination actually, it became increasingly a combination of components and of final products. And now with Trump going after um, the, the Chinese and basically saying we need to reshore, we need to onshore, that those, those chain, supply chains have been ravaged. And they've been ravaged both in terms of end products and in terms of, of, um, of uh, raw materials inputs. But I think what China has tried to do or what, let's say, what producers have tried to do is to shift this towards other Asian countries that are not going to get quite so, uh, so much focus and attention. So you've seen things going to Vietnam and, and, and other places. So there is that, but these are on much, much, much shrunken, much shrunken bases of, of, of uh, economic activity. Not least because if you put trade restrictions on, they will restrict trade regardless. And so I do think we see a, a shifting away. We will see, see a shifting away of, of uh, that rather dominant feature of international trade with um, what in the old days used to be design in the, in the West, production in the East, consumption in the West. And I, I see supply chains shrinking. I see, for example, more localization. So Eastern Europe will probably benefit from this in, in the context of European, the European economy. And there will, of course, be limits to how far the United States can reshore and, and remain efficient and dynamic, you know. So it's not just a, ge a geographical shift. It's also going to be, have real implications for, for long-term growth. Right. Um, uh, Patrick, you know, the, the reason why uh, China joined the trade, uh, uh, WTO, was because there was consensus domestically that opening up trade uh, would provide tremendous amount of jobs, Number one, open up to new ideas, new technology, welcome uh, foreign direct investment, and then the learning of that foreign technology, manufacturing skills, distribution, etc. And, 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 and China, I think all, everyone would agree, gain a lot from this, right? Yeah. Now, uh, from the world global perspective, I think the world prospered also by getting cheap goods. Enormously, but, enormously. You know, Enormously. But where the trade um, uh, seems to have the trade th theory, free trade in physical goods, very little uh, people argue against. But where the uh, downside of globalization uh, people complain about is that, number one, the middle class, the blue collar workers, and then later white collar workers started being hollowed out, right? because the production moved to cheaper economies. Now, the, the, so the arguments within the United States uh, of, of, of reshoring, onshoring again, is basically to provide jobs again for the uh, middle class, right? That's, you know, that's, that's uh, 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 commendable, but the question is whether it will work. So there are really two questions to this. The first one is that if the if trade continues to meet uh, protectionism in the advanced markets. I don't think Europe uh, wants that, but Europe also has its own protectionists for agriculture and other, other issues. The, the, and, and then of course there are increasing protectionism, uh, nationalism in terms of IPR, you know, the, 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 the loss of uh, uh, intellectual property rights, right? The loss of uh, technology that they feel that the Chinese are taking away from them or even other emerging markets. So the key question then, Patrick, I put to you is this. Will India and other emerging markets be able to go on this manufacturing route, uh, and, uh, you know, manufacturing and then trade route? Because if they don't provide enough jobs for their own economies, they're gonna have some big trouble on their hands. So, you know, this is the first trade issue. Then the second trade issue, which is the more difficult one, which we both of us studied, is the, the, the very complicated role of services. Everybody agrees, you know, free trade in goods 
virtually no disagreement. What's your view on the services side? Yeah, I mean, on the on the first question, depends how well the the, the say say China and India. It's notable how much China relies increasingly on its domestic market. Right. And I think that is a phenomenon that we'll be observing in India as well. So to the extent that they can reduce their relative trade reliance, they can, they can mitigate some of the, that impact. But I still think even for countries that are um, large, have large domestic markets, it is still difficult to see how without a reasonable trade regime that allows trade opportunities to be taken advantage of, there, there won't be um, a squeeze on, on, uh, on economies across the world, actually. And in that case, all the social pressures and political difficulties <clears throat> that arise will simply um, be, be ma magnified. So can you repeat the second part of your question? Well, the, you know, the, 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 the second question is, you know, what about services? Where Sorry. Will services? Yes. Well, you know, services is really interesting. I mean, that was what I was focusing on when we were together in Hong Kong. My, my, my research was really directed towards services. The fact is, services are more protected and they're regulated in a very different way. Because in, with, with goods, we can see when people do funny things to goods. They'll hit them at the border. Um, and, and so you, can, you, can, you get a much better idea of what's going on. With services, because services are delivered in different ways, um, are, 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 are transacted in different ways, it's much harder to see what is going on. And there's an awful lot of hidden protection. The degree of protection of services is much more intense. And yet, as economies grow richer, they become more and more service dependent. If you take a, a global average, 70, 75, 80% of output of GDP is services. I mean, what, what does that tell us? And trade, we've always thought that trade, um, there's such a thing as non-tradable services, but actually, with modern technology, and when you measure services correctly in terms of their input value into goods uh, uh, as well as into other services, services are well over 50% of the content of trade. So as, as the services component increases, and as the perception of penetration of service sectors uh, becomes more widely appreciated, the kinds of things that, that uh, happen uh, to services become magnified. I mean, let's take the example of Hong Kong. I used to be a little bit mischievous whenever I went to meetings with government officials because Hong Kong officials would get up and say, we are free trade. We are the, one of the freest traders in the world. And I would say, yes, that, that's true, but you're not free trade. Look at how you treat services, particularly professional services. Or take the Philippines. In the Philippines, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to be born in the Philippines and you have to be educated in the Philippines, otherwise you can't be a lawyer. And when I said to some Filipinos we were working with on our projects when I was in Hong Kong, I said, well, that should be changed then, shouldn't it? And they looked at me and smiled and said, oh, no, no, that would mean changing the constitution. And I said, well, we know who wrote the constitution, don't we? And they said, precisely. So there is a problem, and, and that is actually one of the major challenges, and we really don't know enough about services. So e e essentially, uh, uh, Patrick, what you're saying is that um, the, the, the exchange of goods and services is relatively easy to justify because you have certain things that I don't have, right? Uh, in the services area, it really is about expertise. And today with the internet, uh, if, if both of us are common law jurisdictions, if your lawyers are smarter than mine, um, I don't really need my lawyers because, you know, actually I could get an opinion from your lawyers, right? And uh, in fact, you know, the, the, with artificial intelligence, uh, your lawyers could be able to dig up all the data, all the precedents and uh, provide opinions that are actually much, much better than mine, right? Because mine, mine doesn't have that kind of technology. But, so to a large extent, if, yeah, sorry. 
But it's, those foreign lawyers would not have standing in your jurisdiction. Uh, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So the, 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 then the secret is that, you know, if, if, if your foreign lawyers are able to provide a local lawyer who may not be that smart, but is now supported by AI and all the database, uh, you, know, you know, my lawyers have, have become smarter, except that the, it's really a sharing of the cake, the, you know, sharing of the fees, as it were. And, it, and it's not true free trade, but, you know, the, the, you know, these things cannot be totally prevented. True. Right. No, that's absolutely right. And so there, there is leakage, a lot of leakage, policy leakage, but that, that simply drives the policymakers to be an even, even sillier in terms of what they try to control. Right. Which is why, actually, um, we, you know, we're, 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 we're at the crossroads. And now this is maybe not a bad time to move to COVID because the pandemic has exposed uh, many things uh, uh, in, in the, the, all the flaws and the vulnerabilities of the old system, right? And it, as we've seen with the protests in America, uh, it has you know, sort of blown up all the uh, social inequalities, right? Those people, um, uh, the, the minorities, uh, those people who are less privileged, uh, the African Americans, they are more likely to die than, you know, because they're in the lower income group. Uh, they have to do dirty type jobs, which then you know, uh, expose them more to the uh, uh, virus than anybody else. So it, it expands this. <clears throat> but the lockdown has opened up huge problems. Now, um, our, our former colleague, Dr. Victor Fung, who is a leading free trader, former chairman of the uh, uh, International Chamber of Commerce made a very fundamental point uh, that you know trade is the only way for us to get out of this pandemic uh, uh, recession or depression. And I think I would agree with him. What's your view on this? No, I think that's absolutely right. I think for many many countries, if if the, if if the, if, the, if they can't trade, they've got a problem. Because trade is the, is, the, is the core motor of economic activity for many countries around the world. Domestic markets are still modest, they're small. And in order to progress, they need to grow the trade. And then they can, the, the, through a process of gradual evolution, they can then get the domestic market going. So I think it is extremely serious. And I think there's some numbers which are quite interesting. Um, for the two kind of product areas which are most sensitive to COVID, in the first five months of this year, up to the end of May, 27 countries put uh, restrictions on agricultural products and food. 89 countries put restrictions on medical equipment and pharmaceuticals. Those are the countries that, now you can understand, you can say, okay, we can understand that you're gonna look after your own people first, but there's a limit to that. And there's, no, there's really little, very little that the WTO has been able to do to, de to demarcate what is legitimate in terms of export restrictions in order to look after your own people and export restrictions which simply deny others the, the, the possibilities of, of managing. And the other side of that coin, which is also quite interesting, is that countries that are food dependent and dependent on, on, on imports of medical equipment and, 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 um, and pharmaceuticals. So in the first category for food, uh, 36 countries have actually liberalized their markets. They've opened up the imports. They've reduced tariffs. They've reduced red tape. And in, in, in the case of medical supplies and, and equipment, 101 countries have, have done that. So you have these two sets of countries, one who are seeking to open and the other who, and the other who are seeking to close. And it would seem from a WTO perspective or from an international cooperation perspective that a natural outcome of this could be that countries that want to restrict exports take commitments not to do that and countries that are opening their markets take a commitment to not close them again and then you have a nice combination of interests that would benefit trade and and, and along with increased trade all the benefits that go with it in terms of jobs in terms of incomes and so on. but here we have a we have a tension because there's this little word called resilience Okay, we all want resilience. We all want resilience to deal with COVID-19. But it means different things to different people. There's one set of people, and they tend to be the nationalists, 
for whom resilience means don't trust those foreigners. We've got to be self, we've got to be self-sufficient. We've got to be able to do everything for ourselves. And for the others, resilience means international trade cooperation on the basis of certainty and trust. Those, that's a clash of civilizations. That's a clash of ideas. And it's not clear who's going to win. And that's why the WTO going, going in the next few months is going to have a very difficult job on its hands because they've just lost their, their, their current uh, head and now they're looking for another one. What kind of person will they get and what, what capabilities will such a person have to bring together these interests to get back to the old idea that there are mutual benefits from trade. It is not a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game. So how do we get people into that place? Um, it's, it's, we're really at a bit of a crossroads, and, and COVID-19 has truly helped to create that. And I think the other thing that's important about the aftermath of COVID-19 is that we're not going to go back to where we were. Some fundamental things are going to change. After a decade and more of lax monetary policy, um, money sloshing around, interest rates pretty much at zero. There's an awful lot of flab, awful lot of inefficiency in, in, in many economies. And when it comes to recovery time, there's going to be a real issue as to whether that kind of flab is affordable. So the companies are going to tighten up. And there are estimates that suggest that the, amount of, the number of jobs that will just not reappear, even when the economy is started up, could be as high as 40%. That's a horrifically high figure. I hope it's an exaggeration. But that's, that's going to change. And then there are some structural changes as well. Work, working from home turns out to be quite a nice thing. Something like 80% of, of workers potentially could work at home in, in some economies because they're not on production lines. So the, if a lot of this happens, what's that going to do to the transport sectors? What's that going to do to the real estate sectors? So I think there's all sorts of shifts in, in what will be the normal outcome uh, the, the sort of new normal isn't going to be like the old normal. And that is going to put another pressure on governments to, to do the right thing and to stay open and to recognize that no country can deal with these crises by itself. Everyone needs other countries. However independent they think they are, however self-sufficient they think they are, they cannot do it alone. So how to get that message across and how to make sure that notwithstanding all these challenges, there is a way forward. I think the other thing, which you know a lot more about than I do, is are, is the financial sector going to step up to the plate? Are, are banks going to lend? <laughs> is there going to be a financial crunch? Right, right. I totally agree with you, but, um, uh, and, and I, we, we can have a separate conversation about the, the, the role of finance in this. Um, the, but uh, the crucial issue that you've brought uh, up here uh, are two things, right? Firstly, the WTO is now facing unprecedented changes, right? Firstly, it's major, uh, one of the you know, leading founders uh, you know, is no longer supporting the appellate body, right? Which means that you can't rule on the disputes. And you know, that makes you know, WTO very complicated. And I, 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 I'm, I'm not surprised by whoever was leading uh, the WTO that he is caught between many forces and, it's, it, and in not just the geopolitical clash, uh, as you say, of civilizations, but also so many new issues that are facing the whole challenge of trade in, the, in, the, in technology, yeah. for example, jobs, services, you know, and the, the, the legal uh, conflicts that are going on. So you will really need somebody who has a firm believer and uh, maybe a person who is willing to take a lot of punishment uh, in order to be able to negotiate this complicated. And I think that maybe, Patrick, you should consider yourself. You're still oh, young. No, enough. no, 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 no. I, I, would, this, I can't think of a worse nightmare. You have to really want fame to be willing to take it on a job like that. And you're willing, you've got to pay a very heavy price for it. I think personality will be really important. 
I yes. think geography will matter too. I mean, there are a lot of people saying that the Europeans are actually having a meeting today to decide whether to put a candidate forward. Good. And it's pretty clear that the Americans will look askance at any European candidate. Right. They won't be too happy about that. Um, a Latin American candidate, well, the, um, the, the has there's just been one. Right. Um, an Asian candidate, possibly, but the Asian candidates always run up against a particular problem. Traditionally, the head of WTO cannot be an American and cannot be a Ch Chinese, because these are the two big elephants and neither one can lead the other. So the Asians have another problem, which is that if an Asian gets the job, China doesn't get a deputy director generalship. That means China's nowhere in the hierarchy of the institution. So this is a very unfortunate reality for Asia. I don't know how they're going to how they how that will be dealt with, but it makes it hard for an Asian candidate. Right. Um, which leaves us, which leaves us with the one obvious place, which is Africa. Right. Now Africa has a, just recently a very strong candidate came forward, the former finance minister and man of, of, of Nigeria, and right. the manage, a former managing director of the World Bank. Right. Um, so she's a strong candidate. There's potentially a strong candidate coming out of Kenya. These right. are both women. And it's, a lot of people say it's high time a woman led the institution because a woman never has led the institution. Right. And so you're getting this, this notion that maybe, just maybe, Africa could play a crucial role in, in have a decent shot at playing a crucial role in dealing with all these problems that the system faces. And perhaps I can briefly say a little bit about what those issues are, because there's a number of them. Of course, center stage is the U.S.-China struggle. And if you think of this, not only in terms of com competing economic systems, perhaps even more important, geopolitically, the rise of China. You know, if I was going to be um, a bit mischievous, I'd say, I'd say, to tease my American friends, I'd say, well... You, you got Russia okay, just in time. You got Japan well in time, but you left it too late to get China. Now you're in trouble. You are no longer going to be the kingpin. What are you going to do about it? And so there is that whole element there. And a lot of the kind of discussion in, 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 in the United States is just naked nationalism. So then you put on top of that, you superimpose this genuine dis difference in economic model between the fundamentally market-oriented approach of, of the United States and the growing role of, of uh, state-owned enterprises. Now, some people, and this is one of the big things that the new, new Director General of the WTO is going to have to face, it's all very well for the West to say, let's get China to look more like us. This is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. But what has to happen is that the rules have to be fashioned in a way that can accommodate these differences and still ensure there are mutual gains from exchange. That is going to be a huge challenge for the, for the incumbent. So you put the economic models and the geopolitics together, and you're going to need a pretty f f smart uh, 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 diplomat politician in that job. Maybe it's too much for anybody. But then behind all this, there's a whole lot of things that have been going wrong with the, with the world trading system. And you need an institution like, why do you need an institution like the WTO? You have to have pre-commitment. You have to have a degree of certainty. You have to have a degree of trust. Those are core elements in exchange among sovereign states. And they have been systematically eroded over, the last, over, over recent years. The, the WTO has lost its negotiating function. In fact, the WTO itself, which was, which was established on the back of the GATT um, in 1995, has never had a proper negotiation. It's had a failed negotiation, and it's had a few results which uh, have been positive, things on trade facilitation, um, on uh, high-tech uh, products. But basically, it's lost its negotiating function. That has to come back. The negotiations require... The, an understanding that there are mutual gains and, and that old that word again, trust. So that's, that's another thing. Then the Americans, because they've been very unhappy with the dispute settlement system, the Americans have always got an issue over sharing sovereignty. Uh, they have basically closed down a very important part of the dispute settlement machinery. See, the WTO has its three pillars. 
it negotiates, it administers, and it settles disputes. And if you take one of those pillars away, we've already lost, at least temporarily, the negotiating pillar. Now you take away the dispute settlement pillar, and what have you got left? Something that won't stand by itself indefinitely. So that's the crisis. In addition, you've got a, you've had a, an, and this is one of the things that's really upset the United States in particular, but not only the United States, a constant battle over what the appropriate balance of rights and obligations is in the WTO among countries from very different uh, pos uh, positioning in terms of development and priorities. <clears throat> we call this special and differential treatment. What is, the, what is the appropriate disposition of special and differential treatment? What should different countries be obliged to do? And one of the big complaints that the Americans have against the Chinese is that the China, China says it's a developing country and that supposedly this gives it all sorts of access to all sorts of rights that it wouldn't have if it was not called a developing country. In practice, this is a bit mythical because China does not have any very significant special rights that are respected and which it takes advantage of. It really doesn't. So this is again part of the myth, but there are many countries where this is not mythical and where there's a real need to understand what the appropriate balance is and for countries to buy into that balance. So that is a major problem as well. Forgetting about US-China, that, that anyway sits out there as a, as a real issue. And then we've got this question of transparency. One of the great ideas of the WTO and the gap before it <clears throat> was it was going to be somewhere where you would know you could get all the information you need about the policies of other countries. But if they don't notify those policies, you don't have that information. And there's a serious lapse in just about every country in, their, in, in, in observance of their obligations to notify their trade policies. And then we have the other big, the, I think this is the last really important point that, is, it, that needs to be resolved. Unlike the United Nations with its power-based Security Council and its voting, the WTO and the gap before it have always been consensus-based bodies. So everyone has to agree before something can happen. Well, that is a millstone round the neck because it's not difficult for a, for a consensus requirement to become a veto. All it takes is one country to get up and say, I don't agree. Now, in practice, if that's a very small African country and it stands up and says, I don't agree, it'll get arm twisted and bullied into submission. Nevertheless, that's the truth, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tough, tough way of, of doing business. And so the reason that the WTO has been, or the GATA WTO has been as successful as they have, albeit a qualified success, is because they have managed to maintain a fundamental principle, which is non-discrimination. What I do for you, I will do for everybody else. Obviously, there are exceptions, but they are controlled and understood exceptions. Special and differential treatment is supposed to be one of those. But if you get rid of consensus, is there not a risk that you throw the baby out with the bathwater and you no longer have anything like non-discrimination as a, as a founding and as a core principle of the system. So there's an attempt to get around that by saying we're going to have agreements that do not have to be approved of by everybody. As long as they're non-discriminatory, we can, we can have agreements that are only applicable to a certain number of countries, the ones that want to sign on. And things are moving in that direction. But the dynamic of that is very difficult because if a large country says, I'm not interested, you won't get an agreement. So even with that system, which is a way of getting out from under the veto, you still are severely constrained. So with all that, I'm probably talking too long, but all that kind of signals just how difficult international cooperation is right now in, the, in matters of trade. Well, thank you very much. That was a terrific summary of some very, very complex issues. If I may put it very simply, I mean, you know, trying to summarize what we're trying to say is that, you know, the functions of negotiation, you know, uh, administering the rules, and then, you know, a, a settlement of disputes is a major governance structure over the world. Yeah. And 
uh, it has succeeded. WTO has succeeded because it was very consensus based. It, it wasn't. There was no Security Council of Big Five, you know, making all the vetoes or whatever, or just doing a deal amongst the Big Five, right? But the reality, of course, is that amongst the Big Five or even amongst the Big Ten, if one big player says no, it's a de facto veto, yeah. right? So even though the mechanism doesn't exist. The yeah. question is that in international relations, if the big players don't agree, you know, the rules have difficulty being implemented. And yeah. when you get more and more, you know, finer points, even as you say, if you try to get the rules, but the rules become weaponized, that means I'm using the rule against you, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and if you're a small economy, you don't have much clout, and then you feel, you know, this, you're not being fairly treated, and that, you know, creates even more dissent within the system. So, you know, that, that's extremely helpful because, you know, for someone new to trade, it's very difficult to get advice like that and understand how the big, big, big power plays, you know, affect also the governance system. Mm -hmm. Let me, you know, uh, spend the rest of the time asking something that you're doing recently, which I thought was fascinating. You know, how do you do this uh, uh, capacity exchange using new technology? Yeah, this was not, of course, my idea, but when I was in Hong Kong, well, actually before, when I was in the WTO, there was this person who came along to see me and, uh, and he had this model, which actually has been worked on by some pretty prominent economists over the years. And the idea is, let's go back to basics. Now, if we go back to Adam Smith um, and the idea that, barter, the barter economy is impossible because it requires a double coincidence of wants. This model actually takes the concept of barter, but understands it in a different way from the way that Adam Smith did. Barter isn't about a double coincidence of want. Barter is essentially about a system which runs on credit. So, Transactions could be sequenced through time as long as there was trust. And in small communities, historically, there was trust. There was knowledges of value. There was a kind of consensus about price. And more or less an understanding that markets would clear. So this, this model, this model, this is it's a kind of mutualized entity, which essentially will try to set up those core conditions in order to allow a form of barter, which is the, 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 the utilization of underutilized capacity for exchange. Now, if the market is thick enough, there are enough goods and services on the market, and there's a, a reasonable understanding about price, all you need to fire that market up is that a few people get the credit, get credit. And then velocity will make sure you get a massive degree, a massive number of transactions on a, on a small credit base. And so you have a medium of exchange, but it's a medium of exchange which doesn't have, a, it's not a store of value and it does, it's not interest bearing. It's something that you have no reason to hold other than to transact. And, 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 and this, is called, um, a, a, this is called an eco, which is um, a capacity, exchange of capacity, essentially, um, obligation. So I take my capacity, I've got, I've got a spare capacity, let's say I'm, I'm a, a, a lawyer, I've got spare capacity, I need, I need air travel, um, so I can take my law, legal fees to the air company, the air company will give me f free, free travel. So that's a kind of crude and rather simple example, but you multiply that, and then think about what it is you need from the financial system, and it is a lot less. What you need for this is a this is a private. This is essentially a private mutualized organization. It is it would be backed by by grade A credit worthy companies, who would be basically be the, the governing uh, governing uh, authority. You might want to have governments in there too, um, if if they want to participate in the in the market. But essentially. It's, it's, a, it's a closed system which reproduces the conditions that you needed in, in olden times to have a credit-based uh, system of exchange, which is another word for barter, actually. 
Um, so, so that's in very crude terms what this model is about. And COVID, there's always going to be an opportunity in a crisis. COVID is providing an opportunity possibly for this, these arrangements to take off. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of interest from a, a number of governments in, in seeing whether this is a model that could play a part in recovering um, and in, in getting recovery and, and getting output going again and getting consumption going again. So that's essentially uh, what this model is intended to do. It's intended to ensure that the financial system is not in charge. It's the real economy that is going to make sure that things happen as they should. The financial system will be where it should be, which is a servant of the real economy. Yeah, uh, but, uh, the, uh, you really raised some very fundamental points here. And I think it's extremely creative, this idea, right? First of all, we used to trade what we have, yeah. right? Uh, you know, if, 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 if I have got a bicycle and you've got dollars, uh, you know, I can sell that bicycle to you. But, you know, if you've got excess capacity, that means, you know, I, I, you know, I not only can, can produce 50 bicycles, you know, I've got spare capacity to produce another 30. Yeah. So at the present moment, I'm getting zero for that 30 that I can't sell because, you know, I don't know where the demand is. But that's, that's some value to me. So what you're really saying is that trade has previously evolved through actual practice. You know, we, we learn to trade with you, right? And we learn that the U.S. dollar is the most convenient currency to do this. But if the dollar is being weaponized, because, you know, if I happen to trade with somebody that the United States has a sanction on, I also can get sanctioned. So that's why we use, you know, Bitcoin or whatever cyber currency that is. But the, the, you're really marrying two things through technology, right? The, the, the top end is the bartering of excess capacity, mm -hmm. which previously had no value. Right. And then, you know, if it's on a platform in which we can exchange that information, and somebody says, okay, you know, this is now worth X. Let's barter for this uh, using this cyber obligation. Mm -hmm. facto, the eco, yeah, yeah. A currency token, put it this way, yep. has itself no value, but represents this value that is now being traded. It would create trade where trade did not exist before. Yeah. Domestically so, and internationally. That's right, internationally. So you, 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 you've moved a market by evolution to a market by design. Mm. And that's enabled through technology, which is fascinating because that's what we need in innovation. Because at the present moment, COVID has basically stopped the old business. And it won't, as you say, operate at uh, just in time. It will uh, operate at 50 to 60% of capacity yeah. which means that you've created huge capacity that is underutilized, which means that we'll create lots of unemployment, right? And lots of social disruption. So any market mechanism that we can do to facilitate this would mean a, 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 a game changer, you know? Yeah. And, and, and to some extent, it opens up new ways, you know, to do trade in a very, very different manner. And of course, because, because, because it's based on this notion of exchange of value, it's actually, it's, it's, got, it's got general equilibrium um, uh, implications, which means that market's clear. That's right. No, no, no. I, I, I think this is, this is terrific. I mean, you know, we, we really think that this is a right way to go. Um, well, Patrick, we can carry on this conversation for another hour, but I think time has come up. And I really do want to thank you. I think the students of uh, Wawasan Open University, the partners of, uh, you know, the Georgetown Institute of Open and Advanced Studies, I'm very grateful for you for sparing the time to exchange views and have this conversation. Thank you well, very much. It's been great reconnecting with you, Andrew, and thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. Great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>